broadcasting live. I've not gone live for ages, but I know it gets more reviewers. But I'm doing this now just to prove that I can, because it wouldn't let me go live for a while. But uh, just briefly talking about the Afghanistan situation, there's this argument from Tony Blair and others and from certain Republican figures in the United States that uh, NATO was wrong to withdraw at this time and should have stayed on. But they don't seem to have offered any timetable for withdrawal. You know, 20 years, not long enough. How long do they think it would be before NATO could safely withdraw and leave a viable Afghan government behind that could fend off the Taliban? One year, another 20 years, longer? And um, w what would succeed that hasn't succeeded before? Um, anyway, so uh, if, if, if obviously NATO had reneged on the agreement that it inked with, with the Taliban in Doha last year, then the Taliban would step up their attacks. Well, why shouldn't they? I mean, they wouldn't really be gaining by not fighting. Okay, they wouldn't be getting killed, but they think, well, NATO's never gonna leave unless we pressurize them to leave. So perhaps they had a long war strategy, the Taliban, realizing that they couldn't inflict very heavy casualties on the NATO, but NATO would eventually get um, fed up, sap their will, it was too expensive to make it unpopular, and they would slink off and the Afghan army would, would collapse fairly easy, easily. I mean, I think the Afghan army collapsed much more easily than anybody anticipated, um, even perhaps than the Afghan government or quite recently thought. So why, why did the Afghan army collapse? Or well, partly defalcation on behalf of various functionaries, politicians and army officers in the Afghan army. I've never been to Afghanistan, but um, several of my friends have been journalists there or served there in other capacities saying things like, NATO would disperse funds to the Afghan government and the army, and then that wouldn't be spent on what it was supposed to be spent on in many cases. Um, and some soldiers would be on the list, but would never be there, be non-existent, or sometimes be there only intermittently. But the full salary was, was, was taken either by them or by some officer. So there's an awful lot of peculation from the public uh, exchequer. Um, uh, so there we go. And they're obviously driven by um, uh, tribal rivalries and asperities. Um, and some of them in Outlook are actually not dissimilar to the Taliban. Some of them even tipping off the Taliban what's going on. Some Afghan soldiers even turn their guns on NATO soldiers. Having said that, I don't wish to suggest by any means that all Afghan soldiers were dreadful, and some of them were apparently were valiant and fantastic. And some of those have fled to Western countries, and the United Kingdom is thinking about actually recruiting them from the British Army. Do they want to join a bit like Gurkhas and be allowed to stay permanently? So... Um, uh, I don't buy the argument that staying um, in the long run was the right thing to do. I mean, I do have some doubts. Perhaps keeping several thousand troops, as, as Tony Blair said, would have been a sufficient deterrent for, for, for the Taliban, or to the Taliban, rather. But that deal having been signed, I just don't think that that was, that was a wise idea. Um, not, not electorally smart. I mean, um, Trump, he agreed to withdraw, but didn't actually complete the withdrawal from his term. Obviously, the... The, the deadline was for this September, this month we're in right now. He could have withdrawn, saved money for the United States, um, but he didn't do so. Perhaps he, he calculated that would be a bad look right before the election. He'd more or less delivered peace doing his second term when there's no third term to look, at, look, look at for because, of course, it's not permitted under the Constitution. Um, so Biden actually delivered on that pledge, Trump's pledge, his own pledge, to get out when he was vice president. Biden is said to have behind the, behind the scenes agitated for American withdrawal from, from Afghanistan. Some people have been aghast at the lack of consultation with NATO allies. The special relationship which uh, Britishers often harp on about has been exposed as a sham yet again. So the UK's relationship uh, with the United States is like Monica Lewinsky's relationship with Bill Clinton. The, is the UK is, is down on its knees. And I had an American pundit, must have been two decades ago, say it's precisely because the UK is such a stalwart ally of Washington, D.C., that Uncle Sam doesn't care what the Brits think because they'll fall into line anyway. It's other countries which are not close allies of the United States could go either way, might cooperate, might not, and that, the, um, that they have to work hard for, if the Americans want the cooperation of, say, Sweden or, or New Zealand or somewhere they, they don't have a defence alliance with, um, to actually to win them over, to grant concessions in order to um, gain their cooperation. So uh, that's it about uh, the, the, the Afghan situation. So I feel terribly sorry for the people of Afghanistan. It was, um, uh, well, grimly hilarious to see several heavily armed Talibans, Talibs rather, enter a television studio and there's a clean-shaven newscaster 
um, you know, being, being his suit is a sign of religiosity in the Islamic world. So presumably he sees um, a staunch secularite, secularist rather, and saying, uh, reading the statement, oh, there's nothing to be afraid of now the Taliban are here, which is why they're carrying their uh, weapons into a television studio for him to say that. At least television broadcasts were allowed, even women's faces seen on them, which, well, they've come a long way in 20 years, the Taliban. Um, so they're not as savage as they used to be, and yes, they've killed a few people in Kabul. I mean, that's to be expected, sadly. But, you know, Kabul has been sacked several times over the centuries, and this is probably about the most humane time. There's not been the um, rapine, ruin, and, well, rape that you'd expect, or rap and ruin and rape. So I don't think they've been pillaging things on such a, such a huge scale, and they're saying, yes, people are allowed to leave and so on. But uh, the British Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab says we have to have a dialogue with the Taliban because, you know, de facto they're in charge. They control everything except the Panjshir Valley. No one else shows any inclination to help the um, Afghan army remnants that have fled to the Panjshir Valley fight on. They're supposedly impregnable, meaning five lions, Panjshir. And that's what Ahmed Shah Massoud held out against the, the Soviets, although his reputation is somewhat overblown because sometimes the Soviets signed a truce with him, even paid him not to fight a tactic that the um, NATO was to use with certain Taliban commanders in a few provinces here and there, because the Taliban was not very united. And it remains to be seen whether they start fighting amongst themselves. Because remember the Mujahideen, this umbrella term for seven different factions, seven different factions fighting the Soviets. Once the Soviets were gone, they quickly fell out amongst each other and started fighting each other. Some of them made common cause with the, uh, the quantum communists. And so it went on. But uh, so partly to... to bone his anti-communist credentials, that maybe Ahmed Shah's suit was, his importance was exaggerated in that conflict. And it was an important unifying figure because, you know, the side he joined the Northern Alliance, a lot of them have been former communists. I got an itchy snout and a phone call coming in. Okay, I have to go now. Bye. Bye. How on earth do I log off?